Hello, and welcome to this series of video specials on ESG and sustainable and responsible investing, brought to you by the international law firm Evershirt Sutherland. I'm Phil Sparopoulos, and together with my colleagues and industry experts, we are looking at the various ESG-related initiatives in the UK and within the European Union through a new medium. The coronavirus epidemic has invited a bit of innovation, and so we're delivering content that would ordinarily have formed a seminar in a new multimedia-rich way that hopefully has fewer compromises than a webinar and perhaps some unique features. You be the judge. The launch of this series coincides with the London Climate Action Week Digital, which runs from the 1st to the 3rd of July. And this video is all about scene setting. First up, we'll touch upon the concepts and terminology. That's followed by a brief summary of the regulatory horizon and a look at the potential impact of Brexit. Finally, we're going to discuss what we're seeing as a firm. First things first, what is ESG? ESG. Three letters with a world of meaning. E. Environmental issues or considerations, specifically those relating to the quality and functioning of the natural environment and natural systems. This obviously includes prominent issues like climate change and pollution, but equally waste management, changes in land use and others. S. Social issues or considerations are those relating to the rights, well-being and interests of people and communities. Examples would include issues of human rights, diversity, and labor standards in supply chains, including child labor and slave labor. G, governance issues or considerations are those relating to the governance of companies and other investee entities. For listed companies, this would include matters such as board composition, executive pay, and anti-bribery among others. Sometimes we talk about the integration of ESG. Here we're referring to the consideration of ESG factors in decision making. A lot of focus here is on ESG risks. That might include consideration of direct risks, such as the risk of flooding associated with climate change, but may also include indirect risks like the economic or policy consequences. ESG integration may refer to strategy and product level approaches, but it may be a firm wide commitment through becoming signatories to external standards or applying firm-wide policies. Stewardship is the practice of setting expectations and holding investee companies to account, sometimes through the use of voting power associated with share ownership. Firms might also apply exclusions or screening, which filter out investments or exposures considered to be undesirable or as a way to target desirable exposures. This might be a firm-wide policy or may be tailored on a product-by-product -product basis. The final terms that we would highlight really need to be understood in relation to each other. There are various ways that such information is often presented. Asset managers may want to align with the Investment Association's Excellent Responsible Investment Framework as their reference point. More generically, the Bridges Capital Plus spectrum of capital is very clear and certainly worth your attention. So, what do they say in generic terms? Well, they present information on a continuum or a spectrum. At one extreme is the financial approach, where there is limited or no regard for ESG considerations. And on the other, there is philanthropy, where there's no expectation of a capital return or even preservation. However, the focus and ambiguity is usually around the terms sandwiched in between. The responsible investment approach focuses on the management of ESG risks. This is more concerned with the protection of value rather than affecting change. The next step up would be a sustainable investment approach. Sustainability refers to meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. A sustainable investment approach is open to the opportunities around sustainability factors, and these considerations will drive investment selection and are expected to generate returns. This might mean only investing in best-in-class companies. Impact investing is concerned with addressing societal challenges, whether the return is expected to be competitive or not. As more and more firms shift into this space, the distinctions between these terms of art is becoming increasingly important. And it's more important than ever that firms are clear about the approach they're taking. There can be a world of difference. Hopefully that provides a bit of context. And I do appreciate that many of you will already be familiar with these concepts. We're going to be looking at the detail of some of the pieces of the forthcoming ESG landscape over the course of this series. 
But as this video is all about scene setting, we're shortly going to give you a bite-sized summary of the pipeline. Before we get to that, we would say that these regimes hit various points in the supply chain. For example, taking the chain for the manufacture of financial products, the obligations may attach to product manufacturers, such as asset managers themselves, either on the basis of taking a firm-wide approach to their products or on them as corporate entities in their own right. They might attach at a product level, whether that's the management and operation of the product or the way that it's sold. Some obligations may apply to investee companies or indirectly require information to be gathered about those companies. Finally, the obligations might attach to clients, particularly those in the pensions and insurance space, and manufacturers may need to give commitments or provide information up to their clients. These are the prisms through which we as a firm typically look at ESG obligations with a focus on the manufacturing ecosystem. However, you could equally look at this from a perspective of distribution and examine the steps between manufacturer and end investor. In any case, it's important to understand that these initiatives are going to affect multiple points within the value chain. And with that point noted, here are our bite-sized primers on the legislative pipeline. There are a dozen or so regulatory dossiers that we're tracking. The majority are EU-based, the notable UK ones at this stage are first to consultation on whether premium listed issuers should adopt TCFD disclosures. That's the disclosure standard backed by Mark Carney, the former chairman of the Bank of England. And that consultation closes in October. Secondly, the FCA and PRA have also been collaborating on the Climate Financial Risk Forum and its guides have recently launched. It's focused on the identification, management and disclosure of climate-related financial risk. We don't have firm details on the rest of the FCA's regulatory agenda around green finance, and in the meantime, the FCA is pursuing an anti-greenwashing agenda. The EU has been very active. We have both new regimes and amendments to existing ones. I tend to think of these initiatives in clusters. I also tend to attach a certain priority to them, but clearly the importance of a regime depends on your perspective. I suspect that most folks would see the disclosure regulation, SFDR, as being quite significant. This attaches to a broad range of manufacturers, including fund operators, portfolio managers, pensions and insurance providers, and distributors of those products. It requires pre-contract, ongoing and periodic disclosure around sustainability risk, the adverse impacts of investment decisions on ESG factors, and possibly some product level disclosures, depending on the type of product. It will also require some level of disclosure for all products. It links with the EU taxonomy, a technical framework that helps to assess how green a company is on a scientific, comparable basis. And if you're in a portfolio, it will help you to assess how green your combined portfolio is. Certain products in the scope of the disclosure regulation will need to disclose the taxonomy alignment of their portfolios, among other things. The EU Low Carbon Benchmark Regulation introduces two new types of benchmark under the scope of the Benchmark Regulation. These are the EU Climate Transition Benchmark and the EU Paris Aligned Benchmark. The first is for indices where the constituents are on a decarbonisation trajectory. The second is for indices that are already meeting a Paris Agreement standard. In other words, they're already capturing more carbon than their footprint. This is a supporting piece of legislation, which seems unlikely at this juncture to create direct obligations on product manufacturers. The regulation supports some products under the SSDR by providing a benchmark. The Green Bond Standard is a proposed new voluntary standard for green bonds. Green bonds raise capital for environmental projects. And if this standard comes about and a bond opts into it, it will need to comply with four elements. Alignment with the EU taxonomy, disclosure requirements, reporting, and verification by an external reviewer. The first cluster of initiatives is supported by the second. These regimes all require more transparency, whether that's the second shareholder rights directive, with its requirements for publications of engagement policies and transparency in the voting process, which supports the disclosure regulation, SFDR, the FCA's TCFD consultation, which looks to extract information about the way that listed companies manage climate risks, which may support the sustainability risk or adverse impact assessments under SFDR, or the non-financial reporting directive that's going to require a huge number of large institutions to publish information which will feed taxonomy assessments, such as environmental protection, social responsibility and treatment of employees, respect for human rights, anti-corruption and bribery, and diversity on company boards. 
The CFRF, noted earlier, is all about de-risking the financial services sector and specifically climate change related risks. USITS and AFMD are receiving similar treatment. The amendments proposed will introduce changes to product governance that includes the concept of sustainability preferences within the discussion of the product's target market. Equally, portfolio management will need to account for sustainability risks and the material adverse impact of investment decisions upon sustainability factors. The proposed changes to MIFID II are broadly equivalent. Distribution under MIFID, e.g. through financial advisors and platforms, will need to take account of investors' sustainability preferences and the product's target market. Portfolio management under MIFID will need to consider sustainability risks and the material adverse impact of investment decisions. Solvency II and IDD are respectively the product and distribution regimes for the insurance sector. The changes proposed to these regimes on a product level is broadly equivalent with those for funds under USITS and AFMD. On a distribution level, the changes are equivalent to those for MIFID. We suspect that viewers will be interested to know when these various regimes will land. At the moment, we only know the position in relation to some of them, with the key dates falling throughout the next two and a half years. We're maintaining a timeline tracking these initiatives and when the various pieces fall due. It's not a paid product. Drop a line to your usual Ebershed Sutherland contact to get hold of a copy. As you can tell, a lot of this legislation is of a European origin. An obvious question to ask then is what will be the impact of Brexit? To help answer that question, I'm going to have a quick chat with our professional support lawyer, Tom Pritchard, who's been doing a lot of work on the impact of Brexit and financial services. Tom, another day, another video call. Good to see you. Thanks for sparing me a little bit of time to talk about the impact of Brexit on these European regimes. Great to see you, Phil. And um, as you know, Brexit is one of my favourite subjects. Well, that's going to be important as this is a tricky one to explain. Um, perhaps we should start with the basics and build up from there. So the UK left the EU on the 31st of January 2020, and we're currently in a transitional period that will end on the 1st of January 2021. What happens then? That, that's correct. And um, we have just recently had confirmation from both the EU and HMG that that is a, that is a hard deadline, the 31st of uh, December 2020, for when we leave the transitional period. Um, either side could have asked for an extension, neither side did, but the UK government also said, even if they'd been asked for one, they would have said no. Mm -hmm. um, what happens then? Well, there, in theory, and both sides have signed up to this in the withdrawal agreement and the political declaration, we will have a free trade agreement that has been completed and negotiated, and both sides said at the outset that that was perfectly feasible. <laughs> Um, now, as I'm sure you know, most people do not think that is the case. Um, and there is a, still a chance that we end up with a no-deal Brexit. Uh, personally, I think the most likely outcome is for those things which are relatively simple, like trading goods, I th think you'll find there'll be a holding position. But for those things which are more complex, I think you'll find that there are ongoing negotiations which happen after the deadline. Um, and so we, what we might have is part of a deal, not all of a deal in place mm -hmm. as of that point. The one thing, though, that we can be absolutely certain of, sadly, is that there will not be a deal in place for financial services on that date. That, that we just won't see. Them. Sure. I think we're all braced for that now. Um, I'd love to dive head first into the, the status of all these green finance initiatives, but perhaps we should first say that there are different types of EU law and they aren't created equally. Should we perhaps talk about the difference between directives and regulations or, or rather the most salient difference? Uh, yes, of course. Um, the, the EU has two types of law it creates. Um, uh, one type is directly effective. So what this means is once created, it takes effect in all EU member states automatically um, and from whatever date is put on it. And, and those are generally called regulations, but they also include decisions of council and they also include decisions of the European Court of Justice. <clears throat> okay. On the other hand, you have what's called 
indirectly effective law. Now, that law is um, generally promulgated in the form of directives, and those then need to be adopted into UK law by secondary legislation. Um, and that's why you see, uh, under the European Communities Act, huge rafts and swathes of EU legislation, and you know this, this just you know, goes straight through on a conveyor belt. Uh, notwithstanding that technically we have left um, the EU and uh, legal Brexit was on the 31st January 2020, under the terms of the withdrawal agreement during the transitional and implementation period, we still have to uh, adopt those laws and they are still going through the process and through Parliament right now. Okay, let's examine the position there. Is it correct to say that at the end of the transition period, all EU regulations are going to be a part of UK law? No, uh, they're not <laughs> going to be. They're not going to be part of um, UK law um, just in and of themselves because because they their origin is from the Commission and from the EU and they mm. are directly effective. They're going to have to be onshore. So what we've done is we've set out in the EU Withdrawal Act and various other bits of legislation around that, um, a process of onshoring. And what this means is that all those regulations which are binding on the UK on the 30th of December um, this year will be imported into UK law. Um, however, that's not just as simple as saying, well, we'll just copy them across, because clearly those regulations refer to the Commission, they refer to ESMO, and they refer to bodies we're not going to be part of, and reciprocal rights we will no longer have because we're not part of the EU. So, in the course of onshoring that legislation, what the UK government has done is they said, we are going to amend those, so those gaps are fixed. So, where it refers to ESMA, for example, it will now refer to uh, the Treasury or the FCA or the PRA or, or whatever suitable body. Now, none of that is meant to change policy. And, you know, to a great extent, if you look through these, you know, voluminous and um, really quite dry bits of secondary legislation, they don't change policy. However, the fact that you're taking the EU aspect out of the law that the regulation that you're bringing into the UK clearly does have policy implications on some level and so mm. collectively there are changes to mm. policy although not from the intention of this is our new policy this is what we're going to do just from the fact that we're no longer in the EU that is that is why that happens what about regimes that that don't come into force until later um after the transitional period, well, that that's a little trickier. Um, the the relevant legislation, the EU Withdrawal Act, what it what it provides for is that if a regulation comes into force during the transitional or implementation period, or indeed came into force before legal Brexit back at the end of January, but within that regulation there are implementation dates which extend beyond the end of the transitional implementation period, then those future implementation dates are, in first instance, saved. So let's say you've got a regulation which came into force in March this year, and it's got further elements which actually come into force and, and have effect in March next year and December next year. That, in theory, is all fine and is saved. However, Obviously, it is open to the UK government to say, actually, while this is only halfway in force or what we call in flight, we've looked at it and we don't think it's appropriate for the UK or we think it needs to be tweaked for the UK. So these things are not definite. They're not set in stone. And, and obviously, the UK can at any point look at any of the other onshored regulation and it could amend that as well. Mm. What we're talking about here is only the initial period. So this obviously causes greater concern where we're dealing with um, regulations which have really quite substantial effects and so in some cases, quite controversial effects, um, where it may be that the UK takes a different view. And it is fair to say that both the Treasury, uh, the Governor of the Bank of England, uh, who used to be um, the Chief Executive of the FCA, of course, and the FCA have all said they would like regulation to be more proportionate 
to be more outcomes based and to be um, on a lighter touch basis and that could quite well lead to differences and differences in how these regulations which the broad thrust of which you know we 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 probably generally agree with but that detail may well be different um perhaps to add on a layer of complication um and i think it does in, interact with the point you were just making what about regimes that have multiple legislative acts so a level one regulation and one or more level two regulations or regulatory technical standards that that don't come into force until later um after the transitional period presumably that becomes more discretionary uh, it, it's entirely discretionary so mm. you you have a situation where in theory uh, and, and probably what will happen is the UK will onshore the relevant regulation. But if that level two doesn't come into force until next year, that's a completely new piece of legislation. That, that While it's obviously related, it's not the same piece of, reg, of legislation. So therefore, that won't come into force under the EU Withdrawal Act. That means that the UK authorities will have a choice. And that choice will be they can adopt exactly the same regulation. They, well, subject to the necessary tweaks, so it doesn't refer to ESMA naturally, uh, they could adopt a modified form of that regulation that you know, is more suited to the UK environment. Or they could say, actually, we don't like this one. We're not going to do it. And so th this, this is how you will start to see divergence. And um, I think in reality, divergence, while it will be driven in part by decisions of the UK government, Part of what's going to drive that divergence is that the, the EU's uh, sort of um, conveyor belt of regulation is probably going to move faster than the UK government's, and particularly in this area, you know, as you're talking about with um, you know level twos and so on and so forth, their ability to generate more regulation, I think, is better than ours, or well, better, worse, however you want to see it. Well, yeah, that, that's an interesting point. So maybe in the future, we'll see the FCA and the Treasury stepping in to provide detail that ESMA currently provides in the so-called level two measures. It's interesting to speculate. OK, so for those future dated pieces, we know we're in known unknown territory and that those definitely need to be tracked. OK, that was incredibly helpful. Thank you for your help, Tom. Bye. Thank you very much. In this final segment, we're going to be looking at what firms are asking us about. I have on the line Michaela Walker, my boss and the international head of the firm's financial services practice. Michaela, for any viewers who might not know you and the firm, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about our financial services practice? Yeah, thanks, Phil. So I'm Michaela Walker. I head the financial services team at Evershed Sutherland. We are a global team. We advise clients across the financial services spectrum, across all the key jurisdictions. Um, Michaela, clearly ESG and sustainable and responsible investing is high on our firm's agenda for the year ahead, perhaps many years ahead. What about clients? Is it fair to say that ESG has been rising on the agenda for clients? As we move into some of the easing of the lockdown, people becoming uh, more familiar with with operating in that way, we're starting to see a, a refocus on ESG, probably not least because um, some of the initiatives that are coming out from the EU have some fairly short dated timelines and they're now becoming relatively imminent. And where on the spectrum are questions falling? Are we in the, are we in the technical phase or is it more determining what's out there? So I think at this point, people are still trying to get to grips with the vast array of material, trying to understand what is out there, what's to come, what kicks in when, and then starting to think about how it might apply to them. I don't think people are at the stage yet of, of really getting into the drafting and the detail. And again, not least because we don't have all the detail yet from from the regulators or, or indeed uh, the the ESAs who are who need to supply some of the the technical detail um, in the coming months. Yeah, is that the only reason that firms should be paying attention? Absolutely not. There's a number of reasons why people need to start engaging with ESG. The first is that it's an enormous topic and it's going to be very disruptive to businesses or need a lot of attention from businesses as we move into the next period, probably not least because um, 
some of the initiatives that are coming out from the EU have some fairly short dated timelines and they're now becoming relatively imminent. The working groups that we're seeing firms establish include senior stakeholders from all over the business. This isn't just a product for problem for product or compliance. Everyone really across the business needs to know about this and start to feed in into the, the projects. Mm-hmm. It's very much on the regulator's radar and firms need to be very careful about the products that they're uh, putting out, particularly making sure that they don't overstate their green credentials, so-called greenwashing. And of course, this is something that's in the press all the time at the moment. And there's a, you know, almost a COVID overlay to it because we're seeing uh, governments suggest that, that the green agenda is going to be one of the ways that help economies uh, come out of COVID in, in a quicker way. And I think we saw that from some of the stimulus uh, measures coming out from Germany in, in the last few days where there is going to be support for the automotive industry, but only in relation to, to green automa- automotive. So, um, you know, it is something that I think will, will play a big part as we start to come out from, from COVID. And indeed, of course, investors are very much demanding that people do engage with the green agenda and are looking for firms to, to give them products that um, help them achieve their, their green objectives. Okay, so with all of that in mind, what sorts of solutions is Evershed Sutherland as a firm able to offer clients? Yes, so we can help clients in a number of different ways. Um, As I mentioned previously, we've done quite a bit of training for clients already, but um, we're able to help clients, you know, help their uh, organisations get familiar with the obligations, the the scope of, of what's out there. So we're very happy to do training for people. We can help people think about scope, what products might be in and what might be out with the regulations. We can also help uh, further down the line with drafting of some of the disclosures. Um, So, different ways that we can help clients approach this. Obviously, this series offers an overview and and some focus on on the technical aspects too. Um, What can we offer firms in terms of tailored training? Yeah, so I think we've been doing training sessions every week, really, since the start of the year, although obviously recently those have been virtual. The yeah. majority have provided an overview of the regulatory horizon with a focus on the disclosure regulation and the taxonomy specifically. We're really happy to speak with firms, existing clients or otherwise, who would like some training or a workshop on, on any of these issues. Great. And uh, before we sign off, Michaela, do you have any final comments? Yeah, just to say that obviously you and I are London based or uh, in my case, home counties based, but the team is international and these regimes are landing obviously for clients in Dublin and Luxembourg. And we're seeing similar types of regimes starting to kick off in other jurisdictions as well. So in Asia and also the US, our international regulatory advice service, Regnet, has surveyed other jurisdictions and has a tracker of equivalent and super equivalent obligations, which I'm sure will be of interest to some firms. Brill, thanks very much for your time, Michaela. Speak to you again. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for watching. If you found this video useful, please do check out the other videos in this series. You could also send some feedback to your usual contact. This series is a totally new format for this team. And while we don't have much choice about how we serve content right now, we will do in the future. So if there are aspects of this format that should become part of our new normal, drop us an email. And if you're interested in discussing some tailored training for your wider team, or to talk about any of our other services, please let's talk. Bye for now.